Uh, we're going to continue in our healer, the miracles of Jesus. Uh, it's embracing the outcast. And so we've been really talking about, about healing. I know that in the, it's like, oh, well, healing, you know, we're going we're gonna to manifest a physical healing. That's going to be really cool. Um, but there's so much more. Uh, the spiritual healing, the social healing, the, the relational healing, just like the woman with the issue of blood, uh, the restoration when he called her daughter. It is so significant that he called her daughter, that he restored her into that familial, that family relationship. Today we're going to talk about embracing the outcast. We're talking about the two different healings of the lepers. And, and really the big, the big idea, um, on Sundays it's the one thing, but it's the big idea tonight, is, is Christ really extends healing to the lonely, the outcast, the downtrodden, offering them a place in his church. I really believe that the challenge for the, for the Christian church, the Western church, is not to dissuade these folks from coming in to the church. I don't mean just the physical church. A lot of times we stop them from coming into the physical church. Uh, but, but if they, we don't want them to come into the physical building, goodness gracious, what harm are we doing them coming into the, the body, the capital C? It's really important to understand in this lesson of healing that the Lord does. He, he ministers to the lonely and the outcast yeah. and the downtrodden. Yeah. I would venture to say probably some of us, if not most of us, have been in that situation at some point in our life, have been lonely, have been outcast, and uh, just almost wondering sometimes how in the world did I find myself in this situation? And this is where you find the Lord in those times. So, so if I can pray, we open in prayer. And, and Father, thank you for your word and for your, and for your healing power that we see in Jesus' life. Open our hearts to understand more deeply his compassion and his authority and his love through these miracles. Teach us to come to him with faith and respond with gratitude. Share the good news of his healing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I want to set the scene. Uh, we're going to be talking about, about leprosy. And, and I want to explain it from the Hebrew context, the Hebrew understanding of, of, of leprosy. And, and it was, a, it was a physical and a social impact on those people that were diagnosed with leprosy. And in the ancient Hebrew society, leprosy, it was actually more than a skin disease. It represented impurity and isolation. Um, leprosy in the Hebrew, and I'm going to mess the word up, but tazrath in the Hebrew. And what it is, it's not the same thing as what we know, the modern uh, definition of leprosy, which is called Hansen's disease. This is in the Hebrew, Tezrath, it was referred to, to any disfiguring condition. It could be skin, it could be eczema or, or acne or something like that, or, or maybe hair, um, a cowlick. I, I guess they would put me out of the village. I've got a cowlick in my beard and on the back of my hair. Um, even their clothing or their houses, where there would maybe be mold in their homes, anything that was seen as unclean, any signs of uncleanliness, they were considered ritually impure. The, the Tazrath, it required very specific purification rituals. And the lepers, they were obviously, they were required to stay separate. They had to be isolated, often quarantined away from family and community to avoid con contaminating others. I mean, we went through that, through this, this situation that, was, that we had a couple years ago. Uh, the isolation. And we saw the damage that it did. It put our kids back years behind the, in the learning curve. It put us socially back, economically back. So when, when uh, Elder Joe taught last week about the woman with the issue of blood, she was isolated, had to be isolated because she was, until she was ritually uh, clean. And because she had that issue for 12 years, that's 12 years. I think we'd, we'd I preached one time the message and, um, girls at the time, particularly that, that time that they came into their menstruation cycle, they were usually about 12 years old. So you figure this sister that you talked about last week was about 24 years old when she was redeemed. Think of all that she missed in that young period of her life. Um, so this is where, where leprosy is concerned. It's the same thing. Uh, Leviticus 13 through 14 talks about the law. And if you, if you don't have really anything to do, but <laughs> go back and read Leviticus 13 and 14. It is very specific when it's talking about uh, leprosy and these serious skin conditions and anything that resembles uncleanliness. Uh, I'll just give you a snippet from Leviticus uh, 13, 1, 2. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, if anyone has a swelling or a rash or discolored skin that might develop into a serious skin disease, that person must be brought to Aaron, the priest, or to one of his sons. 
And it goes on and it gives a whole litany of, of conditions and such. But the issue was that the person that was afflicted had to be isolated. First they were diagnosed by a priest, Aaron or one of his sons, and then they were, then they were isolated. And, and the issue was the healed person had to be examined by a priest. So I want to share this because it's going to become relevant when I give you the, the two healing miracles of the, um, of the lepers, where Jesus sent them to go show yourself, present yourself, uh, and offer a sacrifice to the priest. That was the, the uh, Levitical, that was the Mosaic Law's process of being restored into redemption. It wasn't the healing uh, from the priest. It was the verification that they'd been healed that restored them into, into community. So I, I lay that down, the, the Levitical law, to show that Jesus is honoring the law. Uh, like we say, he said, not we said, well, we say because he said he didn't come. He didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill it. So we even see in his healing miracles that he is honoring the law. He is honoring the verification of healing process. So another process, when Jesus sent him to the, to the priest, I want you to understand why he said go to the priest. He wasn't just trying to get him out of his, out of his space, but he was giving him an action command, the go do, the go do, to act out on your faith. Um, and then that would help them to be responsible for verifying uh, the priest and showing that they were clean. Uh, and these two examples that I got from the two um, anchor scriptures we're going to use, the first is from Matthew 8, 4, but, um, but go your way, show yourself to the priest. What is Jesus doing? He's honoring the law through the, through the verification of healing, cleansing, but he's more important, he's giving that person an action item to go do. Like I know uh, last week or so, I think someone was praying over, over J.D.'s shoulder that he had injured. I think when Garrett beat him up on the, on the, um, on the MMA mat. And, uh, and, and I, I saw somebody asking him to, to move his arm, move his shoulder. Do in faith. Go in faith. Luke 17, 14. Um, Jesus says, go show yourselves to the priest. Go. Go. So remember, when we're ministering healing to someone, it is important that we give them an action item in faith. Not, not challenging to flip cartwheels, I, I don't believe so, but, but, but within reason, just something to put their, their faith into action. Simply put their faith into action. And remember, people that have come up for ministry, for healing, they don't know what to do. If they knew what to do, most of the time they would just take care of it themselves. They've got the same Holy Spirit as we do. It is our job when we minister healing to people, we minister deliverance to people, we minister the prophetic to people, is to walk them through it and explain it to them. So it's, we take away the mysticism and we give them action items that they can follow. Um, and so when we talk about what Jesus is doing with these lepers and the big picture of healing is that it's really a process of healing and restoration and it goes beyond curing the illnesses. What he's doing is he's restoring their, their lives. He's restoring the value to their lives um, physically and, and spiritually and socially. Um, Jesus, is, when the healings, he's demonstrating that God's kingdom is where suffering and isolation come to an end. It's where it comes to an end. It, the buck stops there. And that comes through the, through the healing process. So let's look at our first example. It comes from Matthew 8, 1 through 4. Uh, Jesus cleanses a leper. It said, When he had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now, before they jump to the next slide, I want to make sure, like, t we do, I do a Bible study for my sons and son-in-laws. Uh, we do that before we start this. And we went through the Lord's Prayer, like, teaching them, like, there's a process to this. There's a process. Um, because the, the kingdom is a system of governance and rules and regulations. There's a process. So I want you to see when we're reading through this, I want you to see the process. Uh, I'm going to vet it out in just a little bit. But, you know, the leper came and worshipped came and worshiped him. And this is important that we come to God, that we come to the Lord uh, and, and revere him as a holy God. And then he made his petition, if you're willing, uh, you can make me clean. So the next part, three through four, then Jesus put out his hand and touched him. Now remember, this is a leper. You think of the social implications and even the, the prohibitions against touching. But Jesus reached out his hand and touched him saying, I am willing. Be clean. Be cleansed. Immediately, 
his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, see that you tell no one. Remember last week I shared the Davidic secret. Jesus at the time wasn't ready for his full divinity, his full identity to be revealed. So when he healed somebody, he would say, don't tell anybody. Now, what did most people do? They went and told. They're like, they're like us. Don't do that. We like to go do that. But Jesus says, I just want to relate that back to the Sunday message. See that you tell no one. Go your way. Go. Action item. Go. Sent. Uh, show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. So we see this, that, that Jesus is breaking through the social mores, the social prohibitions by, by reaching out and touching this leper. He has also given him an action item to go. And in your faith, you're going to be healed. And in that going and in faith, because, because of the Mosaic law, Jesus honored that as well. And it served as a testimony, not just to the leper, but also to these overly legalistic priests. The healing applies to so many different people. I know we look at it for ourselves, or, but there's so many elements of the holistic process of healing. Um, one of the points that I want to make is, even in the leper's position, uh, that he took a very bold approach. Like he was prohibited by law from coming within close proximity to Jesus, but yet he came before him with humility. Like under the law, he should have kept his distance. You're actually, when you come around anybody, you were supposed to yell out, unclean, unclean, unclean. That's the law. You had to notify people. But this, but this leper didn't do that because of his faith and his desperation. But his faith compelled him to reach out because he saw the, the, the divine in Jesus. And I've told you before, healing can get messy and it can get raw. And it can get undignified. And that's just the truth of it. Um, you know, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, last year I went, to, I went to Don Sarlo's house to pray for him. And, and I said, the Lord's really given me a, he wants me to pray for you the way that I pray over my son, Max. And so Don was very kind and he, and he let me <laughs> be messy and, uh, and very raw. And then at the end, I, I kissed him on his forehead. I was very undignified. But the Lord said, I want you to go pray for him the way you pray over your son, Max. And I kissed Max at the end of the prayer, and I kissed him on the forehead. And I said, I apologize. He said, don't apologize. I just want to tell you that healing, it can get messy, and it can get raw, and it can become undignified. Even when it comes to us, to getting healing, we've got to stop worrying about being so nice. If you don't have five roof rippers, you need five new friends. I mean, this, this leper, this woman, imagine when it says, remember the word multitude, aklos. Remember in the Greek, aklos means what? A confused crowd, a confused multitude. When the woman with the issue of blood. I mean, I worked 26 years working Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras are insane crowds. I, this is what I imagine this sister fighting through to get to Jesus. This is what she was willing to do. She had to rip through, not a roof, but a crowd of people. This guy, by law, is prohibited from coming into close proximity. He's supposed to yell, unclean. He's supposed to yell, unclean. Instead, he called out the name of Jesus. When we're, when we're coming and we're seeking our own healing, we can't be timid about it. We can't be shy about it. We've got to come with, with boldness and expectation. Now, one of the points, this is Lanyap. I tell you in Louisiana, Lanyap means free. Uh, when it says, it starts off, it says, when he had come down from the mountain, we're talking about Jesus, when he had come down from the mountain, Jesus had just delivered his sermon known as the Beatitudes. Like from the top of a mountain. Like this was a big moment in Jesus' ministry on earth. I mean, he was literally on the mountaintop delivering this, this message. But it says he had to do what? He came down from the mountain. What I, will, what I will share is a lot of time we as believers, we don't want to come off that mountain. We get in that presence. We're, we're in a good season. Um, you know, we just, maybe we just got to church. We don't want to get into a messy deliverance or a healing. Jesus came down off the mountain. When we come into to ministry, we've got to come down off the mountain. You can't stay in those mountaintop moments, yet there'll come a day 
for all eternity that we'll be in the presence of God worshiping Him. But when it comes to us in this life ministry, it's done in the valley. It's done in the valley. So I will encourage you, you go and you get your edification and your, and your revelation and impartation, but the ministering to people, it happens in the valley. That's where ministry happens. You know, even, even you know, like on these nights, we get locked into the teachings and, and the classes, and we're like, huh, you know, I didn't know that, or I knew that, and I'm glad that he repeated it. But you know what? We, a lot of times we never actually apply what we're taught. Like, this is kind of a mountaintop experience. It's isolated, it's insulated, it's protected, it's safe. But where we're supposed to do the ministry is in the valley. So I want to challenge you is to not be shy, to not hesitate, to apply what we're learning. Otherwise, like I said, it just becomes an academic exercise. It's just an academic exercise. So, and, and so I just said, um, and I, I want to make sure I've got these notes right. Uh, I wrote them. I just want to make sure they're right. Um, but just like when we ask people to, to take an action in faith of healing, I want to ask you to, to take a step in faith. I want to ask you uh, to leave the security and the isolation of the mountain. I want to challenge you to come down into the valley and minister as Jesus did. And look, it could be at the Walmart. It could be anywhere. Lee and I took Lee out last night. Um, she just finished or published her 100th novel. And, and I took her to her favorite restaurant. And there was a lady in there. And the Holy Spirit said, I want you to give her a word. But he didn't give me the word. He said, I want you to give her a word. I want you to minister to her. And I'm like, sure, if she leads us to our table, I'll, I'll share. Sure enough, here she comes. She leads us to our table. And I just simply, I said, can I give you a word from the Lord if you're willing to receive it? Yes. And this lady was no, no more than five feet tall. And I gave her exactly what the Lord said. I ministered to her in the valley. And at the end of the meal, she comes up. She goes, can I, can I hug you? And, and I did. I stood up and I had to bend all the way over. She was so short, but, but I hugged her. But you know what? But the Lord has allowed me that last night to minister in the valley, in the low places, in the real places where real people live. I want to challenge you, wherever you're at. I never forget when Hema's first time, she prayed for this girl at, at, at a, a big uh, box store. And, and, and the girl started growling. She started growling. And, and so um, take those opportunities to minister where real people are where real people are, okay? So I already said, uh, I want to make the other point when it says a large crowd. In the Greek, remember, that's oklos. It's a confused crowd, right? They're seeking Jesus. They're not sure what's going on. When the, when the leper said, make me clean, in the Greek, uh, it's catharsio. It means to cleanse from sin, free from the influence of error and sin, and to pronounce ceremoniously, ceremonially clean. This is what this guy is asking. He's not just asking to cure the skin disease. He is coming to Christ. He's asking to be made clean, clean of his sin, spiritual cleanliness, and then physical cleanliness. So again, I, I just remind you that, that when you're ministering to people, make sure that your ministry is spiritually first. Make sure that they're saved. Make sure they're saved. I've shared it the first week, I believe. Their eternal salvation will last a lot longer than the bunion on their toe that you drop to your knees to heal. Minister to their spiritual needs first. And then when it says Jesus put out his hand, in the Greek, it's, uh, it's ektino. And I've shared this earlier in the year, and, and I, the Lord brought it back because I want to remind you guys. It's, it's the laying on hands. And even from the Old Testament, the laying on of hands is a powerful transference of supernatural authority. Uh, one, one generation to the next, one legacy to the next. We still lay hands on one another. It means to exert power and energy, to cast out, to let down an anchor, to, to solidify something. And what I tell you this is, with, it's a transference of power. It can either be a, a, um, a holy power as well as it could be a demonic power a cursing power. I shared before, and I want to just keep reminding because we're very active at the altar, particularly on Sundays, but be careful who you allow to lay hands on you. If you're just a little bit unsure, and all you got to do is be nice. Say, so, no, no, I'm not comfortable. No, thank you. There is a transference of power, uh, good and dark. So because we are a, a Holy Spirit-filled church, because we do operate in the deep supernatural things, it also is a place that, that invites all types of supernatural activity. So just a reminder, um, you know, 
be careful of who you let lay hands on you. And be mindful if, if you go to lay hands on someone, uh, especially, you know, a, a male to female or back vice versa. Always, always just ask first, do you mind if I, if I lay hands on you? Um, that's a little land yep, like I said. So when he was cleansed, what did it meant other than just the physical healing, but also the spiritual, but also the communal um, healing. He was able to participate once again in religious rituals, in church. He was free from the stigma of, of impurity. You had mentioned that with the woman with the issue of blood. She had probably not been to church in 12 years, through her most formative years of her young life. She was missing the gathering of the saints. This healing it not only addresses the physical ailment, but also the social and the spiritual. And so these are the things that, that I really want us to think about when we're ministering healing to people, or even when we come for healing. Because, you know, if we know that we've got an internal issue, we need something, uh, it, it, sometimes we can tend to shy away. You know, what are people going to think? And, and all these just stupid stigmas of like, well, they must not be faithful enough if they've got a bunion. or Like, that's just demonic talk. That's to reject that stuff. Reject it. So when you use the, the power of the blood to, to heal, you're restoring their health, and you're also reintegr reintegrating these individuals back into communities. Now, what I want you to look at is when the guy asked Jesus, if you're willing, which is kind of weird, you know, well, if you're willing to heal me. But the truth is, he didn't really know who Jesus was. He comes out of an aklos, a confused crowd of people. He's a guy that wasn't even able to be part of the aklos because he was unclean. So when he asked Jesus, Lord, if you are willing, Lord, if you are willing, and I will, tell, I will venture to say that we get that question daily. Are you willing? Are you willing to do the Father's will? Are you willing to step out in faith and minister healing? Are you willing to help lead someone back to restoration? So you see all of a sudden that question, are you willing? It's really not that weird of a question. We get that question all the time, usually proposed to us by the Holy Spirit. Are you willing to give this hostess the word that I haven't given you yet? And all he wants is a yes. He doesn't even really want you to want to. He just wants you to want to want to. Yeah. And he will. So when he asked Jesus this question, if you're willing, and what did Jesus say? I'm willing. Be cleansed. Be cleansed. There is so much significance of sh uh, and then when Jesus sends him to the priest of showing himself to the priest. And I've shared it before. Jesus is upholding the law by instructing the man to go. He was honoring the Hebrew, Hebrew uh, purification rituals. And it was also a way to restore this man back into communal and spiritual life. And it's something that for us to be sensitive to also is, is when we do minister healing to somebody. It's really be sensitive to what the person is going through. Amen. Be sensitive to the process, that it is a process. We've said before, in, in most of the healings, the Greek word therapia, which is our English word therapy, means it's a process of healing. So if we heal, if we pray for someone, and it's like, well, dude, why are you still limping? <laughs> it's a process. Be sensitive. Help them walk it out in their faith. And then it builds your, your faith too. Um, I want to be super, super uh, respectful of time. I think we've just got a couple seconds left. What I want you to do, I really do, I want you to follow through. Now I'm going to send the video out tomorrow. I'm going to send the teaching, all these notes to you. But in Luke 17, 11 through 19, um, this is the, the, we won't have time to do this tonight, but I'm going to send you all the, the teaching notes um, tomorrow morning. But this is when he cleanses the 10 lepers. And this is really a great example of once again, when, when they came to him and he said, go show yourselves to the priest. And he said that, and they went and they were cleansed. When they went, when they acted in their faith, they were cleansed. And then, uh, then one, one, I'll just summarize. It said when one of them saw that he was healed, he actually returned. And he was a Samaritan of all people, but he actually returned to give glory to God. And then Jesus further blesses him, and he says, your faith has made you well. So I want you to see the distinction in that. One of the last points that we'll make is that Jesus cleansed them, but then when the man came back to show glory to God, God told him, your faith has made you well. There's a difference between the physical healing and the spiritual healing, the holistic healing of being made well. So read that over. Like I said, uh, I want to be a good steward of time. And then... Um, 
but read that scripture when I send those notes out to you. And I want you to look at those words, and I've got them bolded and highlighted so, so you can really look into that. So what I'd like to do, if we can, if we can stand, and let me, let me pray this out. And, and then, then I do. I just want us to spend a little time instead of running out the door. And, because I do know there's some opportunities for, for praying over one another, spiritual healing and physical healing. So Lord, Father, hmm, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your healing power and your compassion. Lord, teach us to approach you in faith, to show kindness to others as you did to the lepers, and to live with grateful hearts. May we be witnesses of your love, sharing your hope, the hope of your kingdom. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We are so grateful to be yielded vessels. Lord, I'm so grateful that you simply ask of us to want, to want, to want to. A simple, simple yielding to the Holy Spirit. Lord, this is a healing church. Earlier in the year, Father, you said a healed church is a healthy church. This is a healed church. This is a healthy church. The next part is a healthy church, is a healing church. So, Lord, I, I pray this commission, I pray this charge over the body, especially these special forces warriors who faithfully come on Wednesdays to be, to be especially equipped. We've got opportunities that abound all around us, Lord. I pray that we see through God goggles. We see those in need of spiritual healing and physical healing. So, Lord, I, I thank you. I thank you for these opportunities to, to share with the body. I'm so excited to hear the, the, the testimonies of healing miracles. Yes, amen. Yes, amen. Mm. Lord, we thank you for you are a good, good father. Hallelujah. Mm. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. amen.